Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Today we're going to speak about a topic that's quite close to my heart um, and the way Father brought this devotional understanding and everything that he wants to show that's on his heart um, was through a dream that, quite, that shook me quite a lot. And um, it, it's, it's basically about the, the disposition that is required of the church um, those workers and in, and in those of the, the children that will be in the church, the, the congregation, uh, whether it's a home or whether it will be an actual building in the time to come, their disposition towards the leadership. So um, it's quite interesting our father brought this um, uh, together. He, as per usual, he does that by bringing uh, various people to on my path uh, with regards to to dreams that they had and they they don't know what father is showing me um, but then he brings it together and you know years ago father told me that he's going to use me as a joseph joseph is known for his dreams and that they will hate me for my dreams he said but he will show me the things that will happen in the future and he will give me the interpretation and so what happens what i've noticed lately is that he uses those that are quite close to me to have dreams that relates to the next devotional and they obviously have no idea about it until I actually receive the dreams from them and say well actually this all turns with what father is showing me so um, you will clearly see um, as I discuss these dreams with you and it was about four dreams not long um, but I will give the interpretations um, and you know just talk about them where they are appropriate um, you know, the previous two devotions that we did, we started with this, uh, we, the series of part one and two of the spirit of Elijah. And we spoke about the first one, part one was about binding the sacrifice to the altar. It was basically about uh, not allowing yourself to get off the altar, to allow him to work in you that character to make you a pillar of faith. Um, I mention a lot um, how we are trees of righteousness, that he makes us pillars, that the church of Smyrna were a pillar, and the church of Smyrna is that John the Baptist or Elijah company that will be sent out during the time to come. And we know that Elijah is linked to Jezebel and how that person that will speak that word of judgment over the spirit of Jezebel that will be operating, uh, not just through the false prophet, but also within the church, that the, the elders, that fivefold ministry, the shepherds, that they themselves need to have gone through a process of fire, of judgment, where God judged them, and remained on the altar until the work is finished, in order to be able to speak that word of judgment that will be as a fire especially when it comes to Jezebel. And then part two, I spoke about the tribe of Benjamin, how this tribe of Benjamin received a blessing that they will be as ravenous wolves in warfare. And I spoke about the disposition where we are to be as innocent as a child, but on the one side as ravenous as wolves like the tribe of Benjamin in the time to come, those shepherds over the flock. And and how this tribe of Benjamin always comes together with Joseph. And I explained all of that. And then I went into the doctrine of Jezebel and the deception that is going to come. So it's very important to devotional te teachings that, that uh, we need to listen to and just listen to it again. And so today we're going to go further and we're going to speak about the disposition towards the f of the flock towards the shepherds. And this is what Father wants to discuss with his disciples. Um, so before we start, let's just pray first and just ask Father's blessing upon this teaching. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to minister your heart to your children, Father. If anything, my prayer is that they will just hear what you have to say. Um, that they will not look at the vessel but that they will hear your spirit speaking to them. And I pray for ears to hear, Father, um, hearts receptive to receive what you have to say, even if we don't like what we hear, Lord. 
and I pray, Father, for your anointing to rest upon me, to be able to speak this. I, Father, you know um, just how this word has affected me. Um, just that sometimes I, I could barely contain it, Father. Just being so emotional because of what you're showing me. And I do believe, Father, it's because you are showing me your heart. You are allowing me to experience your heart before I can speak this. So this is my prayer, Father, <laughs> that this is what will be communicated. Your word says to know God is eternal life. And to know you is to know your heart. It's not just your word, Lord. It's to know the essence of you, the person of you. To really know you. I thank you, Father, for this privilege. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start with the dream that I had that started all of this. But before I start, I, I want to explain the relationship that I have with this person. Now, this person's name is Arthur Cutts. And he is my mentor. He's passed away already in 2005. So I had a dream about him. And um, the relationship that I've built through these years by listening to him is that I consider him as a father. I really do consider him as a father. And um, he, in listening to him, and being able to grow under the shadow of this mighty tree, this pillar of faith, I've learned the, the heart of what it means to be apostolic and prophetic by the anointing that rested upon him. And if I just think that in all the four, approximately 14 years that I've been listening to this man, to his teachings, being under, under his guidance and wisdom, and I think of how Father purposed me to listen, to be brought, that his teachings would be brought on my path, my journey as a Christian, knowing that the call upon my life is to prepare the workers, then my gratitude is immeasurable. The value of it, of what he meant in my life in the most difficult times of suffering that I went through, and having to practically apply, be authentic, and do what I learn, and having to have to walk the talk, no matter how difficult it was, and to be able to have seen that fruit grow in my life to the point where the Lord raised me up to be able to minister to other people. I am immensely grateful. For what father has done through this man um, which I truly consider my father so having said that you know I'm quite jealous about um, his material I don't share it with everybody um, just because I treasure it so much but there's I don't want to give it to anybody or to everybody uh, just because I don't want to cast bulls before swine that's how protective I am over his teachings. Now anybody can look his stuff up if you want to. Um, but you will be held accountable for what you listen to. <laughs> okay, so having said that, here is the dream that I had. I dreamt that I uh, went to somebody's house. I'm not sure what it was. And as I walked into this home, I could see one of the bedroom doors open. And wouldn't you know it, Arthur Katz was sitting on one of the, the beds in the room. I could see him sitting there. And I got all giddy, all excited. And this person told me to sit down and they called um, Art Cuts to come over to me. And he sat next to me and he looked at me with the most loving eyes. He looked at me. Um, you know, that soft eyes of a father with wisdom, this gray hair and this lines, his eyes, laughing lines and just full of wisdom and love and compassion this man looked at me and I you know all giddy started telling him how much he's meant to me through all these years and that I've been listening to his material for uh, 14 years and just how much I've grown and he was just looking and uh, looking at me and listening intently and then he called his mother over almost as he wanted to show his mother one of his children if I can put it that way 
and he called her over to introduce her to me and all of a sudden the scene changes we are outside of this house and uh, the i think it was the person whose house the owner you know came to me and said to me he just wants to tell me that somebody attacked arthur and um and they killed him and the way they attacked him as he was telling me the story i literally saw what happened um, and somebody took a hammer and they um, crushed his head with this hammer and he apparently was in great pain and he died because of it and i woke up from that sobbing i was crying immensely and i cried so much that i cried from the morning six o'clock when i woke up till the evening five o'clock i spoke to my closest friends about it and i cried as one would mourn for a father that's how i cried because you know you experience everything in a dream and i was completely overwhelmed by this dream to experience this and um, as i woke up the spirit said to me the following words the spirit said to me the apostolic foundation has been laid and i was like what does that mean he has prepared those apostles and prophets that will go out that he has already he has finished that and that the time is now here for them to go out so i left that there for him to reveal to me and show whatever he wants to show so as i was listening to what father was saying uh, you know thinking about this foundation that's been laid i couldn't help but think of uh, hebrews 11 and that that foundation was referred to you know hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter and it talks about the uh, the elders that have gone before us um, in uh, Ephesians 2.20 I think it says that um, the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets so Hebrews 11 is actually referring to those apostles and prophets those that have gone before us and laid the foundation of the gospel okay but, you know, one thing that I want to mention, as I woke up from this dream, apart from that words, those words that Father gave me, the following came into my heart. I said to myself, I am willing to die for this man. That's how much I love him. I'm willing to die for this man. And the whole purpose behind this dream was for me to experience these emotions. You know, Father has my emotions. He can do with my heart what He wants. He can allow me to feel whatever I need to feel because He has purpose to use me in this way as well. To allow me to feel what He feels. So what I felt there was that brotherly love that the Lord God requires of us in the time to come as such a sense of love for this spiritual father of mine that I'm willing to die for him so another example of that is in Romans 16 where we read let's go to that in Romans 16 verse 2 and and uh, 3 and this is where Paul is greeting them and he is saying here, yeah, uh, this from verse three: Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers, in other words, my workers, in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You see, Priscilla and Aquila, they represent the Smyrna church they represent those workers that will go out they represent the elders right the fivefold ministry but they also represent those that will be under them that will be sent out as workers and so Paul here is a representation of Christ that we are willing to lay our lives down for Christ 
but he's not just a representation of Christ. He's a representation of an elder for who those who are under him are willing to lay their lives down. So not only will Paul lay his life down for his children, but his children will lay their lives down for him. This is the disposition and the, the heart of what Father wants to talk to us about and why he gave me that dream. So let's go to Hebrews 11 and we're not going to read the whole chapter. You know, the scholars say that uh, the book of Hebrews were written in blood. I think David Pawson mentions it in his series, Unlocking the Bible. I think he mentions it in there as well. Um, you might as well, you know, a book to read with Hebrews is Leviticus, where it talks about um, all the sacrifices and uh, 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 and the high priests and the, the, the priests and how to prepare them. So when you read Hebrews, it talks about our high priest who gave his life. Um, but it also talks about Hebrews 11 of those who have also given their lives. So you see the apostle and high priest of our faith and those under him. He is the great shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, Paul says that the elders must be willingly serve those under them. As shepherds, they must feed the flock so that when the chief shepherd comes, um, that he would be approving of them. And he tells those that are under them to subject, to be submissive under those elders. But that submission is not because they are forced, but because they are willingly submissive. They are, they are walking in the bond of love. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews 11. And we read about this foundation. We're going to read. The first part talks about Enoch. It talks about Noah. It talks about Abram, about Sarah. And you don't hear anything necessarily about sacrifice. But you, you do hear that they went and they obeyed in faith to obtain a city which they could not see with their eyes. And then from verse 33, it gets a bit more gruesome where you can see where there's more sacrifice involved. Let's look and read that. Um, okay, verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. So we've thrown for the lions, sorry. And remember now, we're talking about a foundation that has been laid with blood. Verse 34. Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured not accepting deliverance. They were not willing to save their lives. That they might obtain a better resurrection. That better resurrection is at the last day when he comes back and gives us our inheritance and the dead will be raised. Verse 36. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, Remember, Yeshua said that some of you will be cast into prison and some of you will die. Verse 37, they were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins. Sounds like John the Baptist, right? Being destitute, afflicted and tormented. Of whom the world is not worthy. Not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, because they did it through faith, received not the promise. They didn't receive that promised inheritance, the land, right? God, having provided some better things for us that they without us 
should be made perfect. And now here, there's not a verse 41, but my Bible has a verse 41. I wrote there, by faith, Petra, dot, dot, dot. So I place myself there as well. A witness, they are the heavenly cloud of witnesses. What are witnesses? In scripture, it means martyrs. You don't have to die to be a martyr. When you're suffering and you live a life where you constantly lay your life down, you're also a witness, you're also a martyr. Okay. So here we see that this foundation was laid with blood. Then, as we know, scripture doesn't have chapters. So we have chapter 12. And interesting that chapter 12 starts with the cloud of witnesses and that basically are giving us the torch to run further in building this foundation. Because we know once again he is going to send out his apostles and prophets. Okay. And if you look at Hebrews 12, the number 12 is an apostolic number. There were 12 apostles. It means to point, to judge, to convict, to exhort. And it's got to do with discipline. Now, chapter 12 is exactly about disciplining. Okay. So we're going to come back later to chapter 12. But with the interpretation of um, the dream that I had with art cats, um, Father took me to Luke 11. So let's go to Luke 11. It wasn't just for me to experience what I experienced. The purpose was to give us understanding of um, what will happen in the time to come. Okay, so Luke 11, the disciples, that's the part of the discourse, the disciples ask Yeshua one of the signs, and he speaks to them about the queen of the south that will rise with the men of Nineveh, a representation of the Gentile bride, right? That will, And the workers that will go out. But he then also starts uh, 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 speaking to the, the Pharisees and to the lawyers and the scribes, and he says, whoa, and he talks about um, how they are given over to tradition and all those kinds of things, um, and that he requires that our hearts needs to be cleansed, okay? So they're holding on to all of these things. So let's go to, not John 11, Luke 11. <laughs> and let's read, let me see, where do I want to read from? Um, he's talking to the lawyers in, in verse 46 and he says, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourself touched not the burdens with one of your fingers. Okay, where's that one scripture? Let me just see here quickly. Okay. Um, let's read from verse 47, okay? Now remember, art cuts in my dream, um, he represents the apostles and prophets, okay? Woe, he's speaking to the lawyers, he says to them, Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, the graves of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Remember what happened to art cats, okay? Truly, ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye built their sepulchres curse. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles. So he's talking about the time to come. And some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. It's interesting, it says, between the altar and the temple. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, 
and them that were entering in you hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things. So they're coaxing him, asking him questions and wanting him to, to, to uh, say the wrong thing, listening carefully. Verse 54, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they may accuse him. Now in my dream, somebody hit and killed Odcuts with a hammer. And in Jeremiah 23, the Lord tells Jeremiah, Is my word not like a hammer? And here you find the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers that they are waiting for him to say something wrong in order to use it against him. And in the same way, this is what will happen. So the Lord God wants us to understand that this is the, the type of persecution that will be awaiting those that are sent out, right? And that it will come from not just those who are in authority, because remember we spoke about we will come before kings and, and, and those in authority in the previous, uh, I think it's in Prophets Amongst Us, I spoke about that. And we will go to the churches, we will expose the deception, but we will also speak to the flock. And depending on their disposition, where they are at, they will listen intently to use the words that we speak against us. And it will be as a hammer to kill us. They will either love us or they will hate us. In Acts 20, let's go to Acts 20. And see the disposition of those that uh, uh, Paul was, was with. Let me just see. Paul is wanting to leave. He's, I think he was going to Macedonia. I'm not sure. And he, uh, he's been with these people for three years. And they, uh, 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 they don't want him to leave. And he tells them he is, his conscience is clear, nobody's blood is on his hands, and it's time for him to leave. And they are absolutely sorrowful. And they say to him, uh, in verse 36, this is what Paul does, he says, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. So I'm thinking they're all on the ground listening to him, and he, he goes down in humility, and he, and he kneels down, and he prays with them. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. They didn't want to let him go. They loved him so much. I know in Galatians that um, Paul was talking about his eyesight and that it wasn't pleasant to look at him. And he says, to the church of Galatia, he knows that if it was possible, they would even give their own eyes to him. You can see this absolute love that is of the Father between him and his children. And I truly believe that the Acts 2.0 outpouring that is going to come will be a baptism of the love of God. Because the word says that love endures all things. If I had to have a choice between the power of God and the love of God, I choose the love of God. For the time that we are going in, that which is going to cause us to endure will not be power or glory or those kind of things. Those things will, will minister to people. But that which changes people's hearts will be the love of God. Because we must understand it is going to be a time of great deception and there will be false signs and wonders. But true love breaks down every barrier and is able to endure all things. It believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things and endures all things. And so there will be a baptism of love. And we find in Acts 2, let's go to Acts 2. 
how this love was manifested. Before we go there, let me let, let me not get sidetracked. <laughs> it is very possible. Um, let me see. Where do I want to go? I'm going to tell you about a dream that my friend had, Chantal. She had a dream that she and her husband uh, went to a bar. Okay, not something they would do, but they in the dream they're at a pub, and they're drinking Jägermeister, and it is horrible. She says they didn't like it at all. They told the the, the bartender or the owner, uh, you know, they really need to talk to the manufacturer of this because it absolutely tastes horrible. And that was the end of a dream. And she felt that she needed to just check, you know, where where's the egg meister made. And it's actually made at Wolf Bottle. Now, the wolf theme seems to come up quite a lot. So I find that very interesting. And the word uh, uh, battle is, you know, uh, it means uh, a messenger or a court officer. So you've got this Jägermeister that means master huntsman that they she and her husband represents the apostles and prophets being sent out the smyrna group and what they are drinking okay tastes bitter and it means master huntsman made in wolf battle in germany and battle means court officer a messenger so it speaks of that persecution that will taste bitter. And I read up about it and it says that it tastes like almost like a bitter liqueur. And the person, uh, the inventor of this uh, Jägermeister's name was Kurt Mast. And he was an avid hunts, huntsman. And on the, the label of the Jägermeister, we find a stag or a deer. Okay. And this... Kurt Most used to first produce vinegar, which is bitter. So what we find here, why Father is using this as an example, is to show us that this bitterness, this root of bitterness, is the source of the persecution. Now, remember I mentioned that in Ezekiel, he, the Son of Man is sent out, right? And he is given a scroll to eat. And on that scroll is written lamentations, mournings, and woes. Now, on the label itself is the number 56. And it means to mourn in the Strongs. So they, the apostles and prophets, will be eating a scroll of persecution that will be bitter. Because... It is out of bitterness and envy they will be persecuted just as Christ was persecuted in the same way. Okay, so that's where that comes from. So after she told me, or oh, I think it might have been the same morning, I can't remember, I think it's the same morning, she, uh, uh, I went into my computer and my screensaver was a bird and I saw the name of the bird, never seen the bird before, and it was a killdeer. Really? Kill deer. Um, so that, that said a lot. And I found in that week, um, I noticed that when people wrote something to me, or email me or whatever, then they would call me Dear Petra. And I just noticed that. Now, obviously, you don't write it the same way, but the fact that I noticed it brought the impression of Dear. And my daughter and I also watched something and I, I, I said to her, oh, this girl has the most beautiful eyes. And she says, yes, you call it doe eyes. I'm like, you don't say. <laughs> so uh, um, this made me think, you know, who is this deer that the enemy is hunting, this master huntman? And we know that in uh, Song of Solomon, the bride, in verse 17, tells the bridegroom, she says to him that he must leap over the mountains like a doe and like a hart, okay, and which is a stag or a deer. So the bridegroom himself is a deer, okay, that the enemy wants to hunt. But we also know in Psalm 42 that David wrote, he says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul thirsts for you. 
And in Habakkuk 2, uh, uh, the last verse, I think he says that um, he makes my feet like hind's feet on the mountain. A hind is also a deer. So the bride is also a deer. So who does the enemy hunt? He hunts the deers, the innocent ones of God. And a deer in, in, in Hebrew, I think it's pronounced ayil, um, it's considered in Leviticus as a, a, a pure or a, 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 a clean animal, okay, that is used for sacrificial purposes. So it talks about a, sacri a sacrifice unto the Lord and that the enemy is hunting them. Okay, so you just see how Father has purposed her to dream this dream so that she can tell me about it just after I've dreamed something of my own personal mentor that's also an apostle prophet that were killed in this dream. Okay, so Father's clearly speaking to us about this. So um, another friend of mine also had a dream. And in this dream, she is... Uh, 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 her name's Maya, and Maya is dreaming that she is in an auditorium, almost like a community center, she says, and it's like half circle, and she is sitting with her, uh, at, at the back with her, she calls him baby Levine, no, her husband and her, the, the baby uh, shares the same name. So baby Levi is at the back and she is cleaning his diaper. And she says it's just glass everywhere and the sun is shining on them. And um, so she's cleaning his diaper. And suddenly she becomes aware that somebody is standing at the door. And without looking up, she already realizes that it is Levi's ex-girlfriend. Okay, and she is there and she's looking in and she realizes that she is smirking. And after she smirked and have a good look, she walks away. And that was the end of the dream. And so the interpretation of this dream is that of generational curses. Because baby Levi shares the same name as the father, right? And baby Levi's nappy is being cleaned. His diaper is being cleaned. And so it talks about sanctifying and cleansing the children, right? And the glass windows talks about revelation and the sun shining on, revealing what is happening here, what you are cleaning here. So the woman, the ex-girlfriend of Levi, her husband, is standing at the door watching. And that is a reference to sin waiting at the door. Okay, so why did Father bring this up? Because this is a reference to Cain and Abel. So let's go to Cain and Abel, and that's in Genesis 4. We know what happened there, but there's something important that we need to, to read in Genesis 4 with regards to what happened there. So that we can understand. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's read from verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flocks and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, like Maya's dream, right? And unto thee shall be his desire, 
and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, from the foundation. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive, and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So we find here that Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. It's interesting from the get-go, we are provided here as to why. The reason why is because he was the tiller of the ground. He brought fruit of the ground. Now, tilling of the ground is a reference to the curse that was spoken over Adam. Because when Adam sinned, he was told by the sweat of the brow, of his brow, he would till the ground. Okay? So, to till the ground is a reference to not walk by faith, not, uh, uh, and to, to work uh, by the sweat of your brow. In other words, to, to trust in flesh, to exert yourself, and not being in God's rest. Such a sacrifice... Father God cannot receive because the Hebrews tells us, the book of Hebrews, that without faith it is impossible to please God. But then we find Abel, a keeper of the flock, and what he brought was his flock and the fat thereof. Now the priests ate of the fat. It speaks of the favor of God and it also speaks of a whole burnt offering. In other words, what Abel brought was blood. Blood as a sacrifice because with, with covenant, blood is required. Uh, Cain brought of the land. He brought of his works where Abel brought by faith and by sacrifice. And when Cain saw that, Bitterness and offense rose up in his heart. Think of this religious spirit that does not like to be placed in their place, does not like to be told to submit, does not like to be told you are in the flesh, does not like to be told you have to do something. That religious spirit then sees the favor of God on those who are walking in obedience and by faith and envy and bitterness grow in their heart and they start to persecute and watch and lay in wait for any words they can use then against that person. And so here the Lord God tells him, why are you a sad sack when you have sinned? Why? Is your face cast down? Why are you angry? Don't you know that the blood of your brother is crying out to me from the ground, from the foundation, just like all the apostles and prophets that followed after that, their blood has been crying out to the Lord God. And so when Luke 11, Yeshua tells tells him this generation that you and I are in will be held accountable from, for all the blood that has been crying out from Abel until now. That is a grave warning that is given to us with regards to how we go about those that he has set over us. And I mean those that are true, true apostles and prophets. Because Yeshua said, to hate is to murder. And so how we are to guard against that offense in our heart. Because when John the Baptist was in prison, he asked his disciples to go to Yeshua and say, and ask him, are you the one 
that have been prophesied about. Are you that salvation? And Yeshua told him, go back to John and say to him that if he doesn't want to believe me, at least believe the signs and wonders. But make sure to tell him this. Blessed are those who are not offended in me. Here is John. His head is about to be chopped off. Sorely disappointed in whom he thought earlier was the Lamb of God and pointed his two disciples to and say, follow him. Who saw him being baptized and saw the Spirit come down upon him. Even though he saw all of that, when he was cast into prison, he doubted. He doubted and he was offended because God did not answer. God did not provide the way he wanted to provide. And so the Lord God is saying to you and me, the workers and the elders, those the shepherds that will be sent out, the apostles and prophets, blessed are you when it's going to be so difficult that you will not be offended in me. Okay, so that is the message in that. So when I mentioned earlier, earlier about Hebrews 12 being that ap apostolic chapter, if I can put it that way, because of the discipline that is spoken about. So let's go to Hebrews 12, because we are given the torch now to finish this foundation that has been laid, right? That in my dream, he told me that a foundation has been laid. That foundation he was talking about is twofold. It's the foundation that has been laid by the apostles and prophets that have gone before us in Hebrews 11. But it's also the foundation of those apostles and prophets that is now going to be sent out. He was saying to me, I'm telling you, my work is finished. It's time for them to go out. Okay. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and we read about what he's requiring of us in this time he says that we've got this cloud of witnesses okay and that we uh let's need to lay aside every weight okay and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us but we're taking the torch from them that have gone before us that laid the foundation and we now he is encouraging us and saying, remember those that have gone before you and laid the foundation with their blood and, and let us run this race. Okay, And then he starts telling them that they have not resisted yet to the point of blood like Yeshua did, but that he is disciplining them because if they weren't sons and daughters, um, he wouldn't discipline them. But because they are, he's disciplining them. They're not bastards. But they are sons and daughters. We are his sons and daughters. And he's disciplining us. And then he says in verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace. In other words, forgive one another. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently. In other words, be very careful. And continually look for it. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So this root of bitterness, he mentions right off the bat to say, understand that within the church, because of the tribulation, people, they, their love will wax cold. Their hearts will grow cold and they will grow bitter because they will want to, they will feel so out of control because of the persecution and they will want to seek that which is profitable and can help themselves first. But if everybody looked after each other, that will bring uh, unity and protection and care for one another. We find the example of Acts Two, where we could see the disposition of those of the church, the first church, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's read that. Verse 44, And all that believed were together and had things in common. 
Okay, so they were all in the same boat and sold their possessions and goods and parted the, them to all men as every man needed. And they continually daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so Yeshua tells these disciples in Luke 10, he tells them, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst the wolves. The wolves, a representation of the persecution that will happen. And he tells them, you will go from house to house and eat whatever is given unto you. And then he tells them, don't go hop house, house hopping for the best food. You stay there as long as I need you to stay. And so they shared everything they had. And we have the example of Ananias and Sapphira that when they came, they uh, sold land and they did not give what they needed to give. They gave in part and the, uh, uh, Ananias fell dead. And Sapphira, when she came in, she also fell dead because they lied to the spirit. They gave in part because they were thinking of how can I look after me first? And when you have the love that we spoke about right in the beginning of Acts 20, how they felt about Paul leaving and how Paul talks about the Galatians that would even give their own eyes and, and the love that I expressed and felt towards art in my dream, but I would, I'm willing to give my life. If that kind of love is not fostered within the church, right? And everybody looks to themselves, how they can survive. Then that's when that root of bitterness starts taking place and it defiles many. That's exactly what the enemy would like. So this is what the Lord God is wanting with those who have already prepped. He has worked in so many across the world to prepare for the tribulation when hunger comes, where uh, uh, MPs go out, where uh, uh, different things. We has prepared those uh, 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 the hearts of people to, to prepare for those who will come. And will need, and so that is exactly what he has already done, and it, it touches my heart so much as I speak to these people because he has not prepared in my heart to prepare anything because I know he's going to send me out and he's going to send me to these people. I don't know who they are, but in the right time, I will come to these people's homes and he will have provided. What a wonderful provision he has given us. And so those people do not have an understanding that they've actually been prepping for those shepherds and people that he will send. They will hoard for themselves. Which in the first place is not theirs. Because everything we have, we've received from him. Okay, so let's go to this love. Um... In John 15, where Yeshua talks about uh, this love. It's a well-known verse, but this is where I got the title of the, the, the video, the teaching. Um, verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that... My joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, so that and that your fruit should remain, and whatsoever um, ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. 
and I think it's in what chapter is in John 3 not sure where he says to his disciples this is how they will know that you are my disciples he says I give you a new commandment that you love one another and this is how they will know that you are my disciples when you love one another it's as if to say there will be many disciples there will be many that say they follow me but the way the world will know that you are my disciples is when you love one another how will they know because you are willing to lay your life down just like Smyrna and Priscilla were willing to put their necks on the line for Paul. Just like the other churches were willing to die for those shepherds. And the shepherds for them. Because, as John 10 says, that the shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And this is what the shepherds will do. They will, are destined to die for their sheep. I'll read that to you now. I'm not saying everybody will die. But if you are a shepherd, you've already supposed to have counted that cost. Okay. So the word friend in John 15, it's uh, Strong's 5384, and it means one of the bridegroom's friends. Now, John the Baptist is known as the bridegroom's friend or the friend of the bridegroom who on his behalf asked the hand of the bride and rendered him various services in closing the marriage and celebrating the nuptials. Exactly what the workers will be doing. Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4. And let's just read what Paul says here to the Corinthians. He's, uh, you know, he's rebuking them because they consider themselves wise and, and, and all those type of things. Um, judging one another, taking one another to court. And these are the type of issues that, that Paul had to dealt with when he goes, and the other apostles when they went to the different churches, um, is uh, division amongst each other, bitterness, envy, fornication, adultery, law versus grace, uh, Sabbaths, those type of things. Exactly what we find in the church now. So they had to dealt, deal with that. Okay, And these are all that were used by the enemy to bring disunity, to break up that brotherly love, that bond of love. So let's read here in 1 Corinthians 4 what Paul is saying here to them. Verse 9. Okay. For I think that God have set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. So listen to everything the apostles go through, right? A, spect a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. He's being sarcastic with them. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Yeshua said, you will be hated by all men. Verse 11, even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst. They're hungry and they're thirsty. They don't always have food, but people don't always provide for them. And are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Remember, they go from house to house. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So these apostles will be going through so much and they will be so dependent on their children to look after them on those who God has appointed upon their hearts 
to prepare a place. We will be so dependent on the love for one another, the church. That will be the disposition, the mark of a true disciple, is the love that they will have for one another. Let's go to 1 John 3 and listen to what John tells us in 1 John 3 with regards to this love. Let's read from... Um, Verse 10, 1 John 3 verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest. Okay, let's put it another way. This is how they will know that you are my disciples. And the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Not as Cain, here is brought up again, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. He was of the flesh. Did not walk by faith. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Need, that needs to be read again. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. John 15 is not just about Yeshua laying his life down for us. And it's not just about them laying their lives down for him. But it's about us laying our lives down for one another in the time to come. Because of the love we have for one another. And that love is fostered out of a deep gratitude of having been saved from destruction. It's, it's out of a deep gratitude of being forgiven. The word says, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. The word says that love covers a multitude of sin. It's not easily offended, does not keep book. So it is by this love that we will be able to lay our lives down for one another. And if that love is not in us, we can forget about it. Okay. Verse 17, but whoso hath this world's good. Now he's talking about when you have something. Okay. And see if his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? If you see your brother in the time to come, and you are able to supply for him and give him, and you're not willing to give it to him because you're too worried about yourself, because you do not actually trust God to provide for you, how is the love of God in you? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. He's saying, walk the talk. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. So he's saying here, you know, the love, the way 
they will know that you're my disciples is that you will lay your life down for one another. And that way it's not just physically lay down as well, but also that you are willing to give that which you have. Do you understand how difficult that's going to be in a time of great poverty and persecution? When you want to save your children or children that are with you, when you want to uh, save your wife or your husband or whatever the case may be. Do you understand how this love that will be needed amongst one another is our security in the time to come? And how we need him to deal with whatever bitterness is in our heart. Now, already. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews 10, verse 33 and 34. Okay, this is Paul speaking here. He says, um, Let's read from verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were eliminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. He's talking about the great affliction and tribulation that they've gone through. He says, for you had compassion on me in my bonds. And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. So he's telling them, when I was in bonds, and whilst you were going through so much suffering and had so little, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You were willing to give what you have. The little that you had, you were willing to give it to me. Cast not away your confidence. Don't forget your eternal reward that waits for you on the last day where you will rule and reign as kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Okay. So my friend had another dream. Chantal, she had another dream. And she dreamt that she and her husband and her mother-in-law um, were suddenly caught up in a tornado. And she said she just saw the furniture going around and it was just absolute chaos. And in that moment, they found themselves in the eye of the storm. And with great strength, she threw herself on top of her mother-in-law. She said with her whole body, she was holding on to her mother-in-law. And with her one hand, she was holding on to her, the forearm of her husband. And the next moment, she lost her grip of her husband. And he got lost and was taken up in the tornado. The dream changed then when she found herself on her bed crying desperately trying to get hold of her husband over the cell phone and it every time went to a voice message and she just knew in her heart that he is alive he's not dead he's alive and in came her sister-in-law and told her it's time you give up now her sister-in-law is an unbeliever and her sister told her it's time you give up you need to understand the time has now gone past enough for us to realize that he is not coming back and she would just not accept that and she was crying and after a while in comes her husband and she says he is battered and bruised he is limping he's walking in and she's so surprised he's got dry blood on his face and she just you know she's obviously overwhelmed that here he is but just shocked by what he looks like and he falls on the bed in a called up position and all he says to her, says to her is where's the bucky now bucky is a pickup truck in in south africa we call it a bucky and he asked her where's the bucky is the bucky okay did the bucky make it and that was the end of the dream now what this dream represents is first of all she and her husband represents the apostles and prophets but they also represent husband and wife and thirdly they represent Christ and the bride. Okay, so what happened is there was a tornado. The tornado speaks of a storm, 
right? Something big that happens or tribulation if we're going to look at it in a prophetic uh, context. So it's tribulation, there's the storm. She throws herself on top of her mother-in-law, a full weight. Now her mother-in-law represents the law. And she's holding with her whole body onto her mother. But only with her hand onto her husband, on his arm. And she loses him. So her mother-in-law represents the law. So when you go into a court of law, you fight for your rights. So she represents those within the church, whether it be the children, the flock that the shepherds need to look after, right? The heads, like a husband is the head, that you need to look after them and fighting for their rights, not willing to submit themselves, right? Holding on with their whole being onto the law, onto what they believe is right, right? Um, then in the process, Losing their first love. They are so concerned about being right that protecting the bond of love, being introspective of what is in my heart, why am I fighting so hard for this? They lose sight of what is most important and that is their first love. And so only when she came to a place of rest, which was on the bed, and not hearing from him, longing to hear, she came to the place where her rights were no longer important. Because in the end, she saved a mother-in-law but lost him. She saved her rights but lost him. And only once she came into that place of rest, crying out to him, could he walked in. And what did she see? A bruised and battered husband. And so what Father is saying through this dream is, you need to understand, just like the husband and wife is one body and one spirit, so the bride and Christ is one flesh, one body, one spirit. And when you fight amongst each other, you are fighting my body. And so our husband is a representation of Christ, what he looks like when the body of Christ fights amongst each other. Because they are actually bruising him now how great a reality is that knowledge to us do we understand that that when we fight one another when we leave comments on youtube videos because we don't like somebody else's comment and we backbite and we rude and we call them stupid or whatever the case may be it's so easy to leave a comment, but you understand what is in your heart. You understand the greater picture of what is happening. So the Lord God wants us to understand that this brotherly love is so important for the time to come in order to protect us because the opposite spirit is that spirit of Jezebel which persecutes the apostles and prophets and will do work with that religious spirit in the time to come. And so he's asking her about the bucky, and the bucky, the pickup truck, represents ministry, represents the purposes of God. And as Christ, he is asking, what happened to our purpose? What happened to our inheritance, that which we are working towards? Are you willing to lose that just so that you can be right? Are you willing to forfeit your inheritance just so that you can hold on to what you think is right? And how do we not do this in the church at the moment? How many people are not bickering about Sabbaths, about um what is lawful to eat or not lawful to eat, um, about Torah or not Torah, about law and grace, about oasis, about um, which calendar, which name to use. Bickering, where the flat earth, where the globe. It's not that these things are not important, but how we talk about it and how we hold on to it, it becomes a law unto us. And we, instead of being liberated by the love of God, we are bound by our rights and we hold on to these things as unto a mother-in-law with our full weight. 
and we think we are doing a service unto God, where in fact we are bruising the body of Christ. This is why he needs us to pay attention to what we do and how we submit to one another in love. And what it really means to love the way he loved. You know, that word lay down is comes from G2749, and it means of vessels of a throne, of the site of a city, of grain and other things laid up together. Now think of the harvest being brought in, and that the seal spirit is that foundation that's being laid, of a foundation. That's what it talks about. When you lay your life down, that in 1 Corinthians 4 says, as Christ laid his life down, so we need to lay our lives down for one another. That lay down is to lay a foundation. And didn't Hebrews 11 bring a clear understanding that that foundation is laid with blood? Didn't Cain's uh, uh, killing Abel, that blood flow into the ground? And doesn't it say in 1 John 3 that uh, 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 that he's referring to Cain that murdered his brother and that all the prophets and uh, 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 apostles and everybody who have died that their blood that this generation will be held accountable for it let's read about that in Revelation 6 Revelation 6 talks about those under the altar okay Okay, from verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So God has predetermined who will die a martyr's death. He says here that they should be killed. So some will die and some will be cast into prison. And Paul said that they were appointed unto death. So we have to understand that this blood, these are crying from under the altar of God for all these ages. God hears all the apostles and all the prophets that have died at the hands of this religious spirit that will rise up even stronger in the time to come. He hears their cries and he's going to answer it. You want to know how he's going to answer it? Let's go to Revelation 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous. Now, waters represent people. Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged them. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood 
to drink, for they are worthy. That is how he feels about those apostles and prophets, those shepherds, those elders that will lay their lives down. And those workers and anybody in this time that will die a martyr's death and have been persecuted, whose blood cries out under the altar up until now and also will be during the tribulation. He will answer that and he will avenge it, avenge it with the vials, with the woes. Right at the end, he will pour out blood. That is his love towards them. You know, I think it's in Romans 12 where he says, Avenge not, but rather give room to vengeance. For vengeance belongs to the Lord. If we cannot even show mercy to one another, how will we show mercy to the lost? If we bicker and bite within our homes, if you are an unsubmissive wife to your husband, and you have bitterness in your heart, if you are unsubmissive to your parents, no matter how old they are or how old you are, if your husband do not love your wife as Christ loved his, the bride by laying his life down, how will you do it for the world? How will how will we ever be a true testimony of what it means to be his disciple? A new commandment I give unto you, that you will love one another as I have loved you. By this the world will know that you love me, or that you are my disciples, when you love one another. When you truly love one one another. I pray you hear the heart of God in this. That you will seek his face to show you, is there any bitterness in my heart, Lord? Show me how to be long-suffering and patient and forgiving towards those now who wrong me and hurt me who treat me spitefully. How can I serve them? How can I now show the love of God? How can I serve them the way you served? How can I wash their feet? Not literally, but in my daily life. How can I bless them? How can I Protect the unity and the peace within my home, where I go to. Am I producing the fragrance of suffering? I've got a devotional called this fragrance of suffering. How can I produce that? That the whole house will be filled with the fragrance that have been poured out of a life that has been broken upon the feet of Christ as Mary did and she poured that alabaster box the ointment on his feet the feet represent those who go out to bring the message those who will be sent out the apostles when we anoint them we anoint his feet when we minister and love them when we minister and love those over us this is what he requires of us. I think let's just, I think I've said whatever I needed to say. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you that nobody is really sufficient for this unless we bind the sacrifice to the altar and allow the high priest to cut. To use that two-edged sword and cut away, just like a surgeon would do, that which is dead, that which rots, that which has grown like a cancer 
into our fiber so that when we speak out of the abundance of our heart, it will be clear, pure water of life that brings healing and minister to those who hear. Unless you cut away, unless you do in our hearts what needs to be done, how will we love one another, Father? I pray that those who have listened to this, Lord, will hear and see those areas where they need to bring what they hold on to as a mother-in-law and in the process lose their first love, thinking that they are fighting for their first love. That we will not use the hammer of the word of God to persecute those that look after the flock. It's not that we should give in to deception, but we should be long-suffering, Lord. We should pray more than when you speak more, Lord. Speak less, pray more. The word says that we've got two ears and one mouth. Help us, Father, to see the way you see. You are so long-suffering and caring towards us and our faults. Fill us with that love that covers a multitude of sin among the brethren. Work in our hearts that disposition of knowing that we are to lay our lives down for one another. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.